Hello, we're going to talk today about the Sovereign Rarities uh, New York Sale Group auction in uh, January 2020, which is held in conjunction with uh, Goldberg and Dmitry Markov and them and them numismatics. Uh, the auction takes place as part of the New York International Coin Convention and the World Coin Sale, specifically, we're going to talk about, which is taking place on Wednesday, the 15th of January 2020 at 7 pm in the evening New York time. That's about midnight English time. And we have a number of lots that are very, very interesting as part of the Neil Smith collection of British silver coins, which is basically a collection that's been formulated over a 20 year period of the finest uh, portrait coins from Alfred the Great right through to Queen Elizabeth II. Um, the collection consists of 57 coins, um, it was portraits of all the kings and queens of England in that period of time. The only one that's not there is uh, Eadwig, because you cannot get an Eadwig portrait penny, because all of them are in museums. Um, so there's a non-portrait penny of Eadwig in there, the Anglo-Saxon king, who was a boy king. Um, but the highlights in the sale, the 57 coins we're going to talk about, there are 14 major highlights I want to highlight in this uh, conversation now. Uh, starting with the earliest coin, the Alfred the Great Penny. Uh, the Alfred the Great Penny is the portrait piece of him facing to the right. Um, on the reverse, we have the Londinia monogram. Uh, the coin is estimated at $12,500. This is the most desirable type of coin for Alfred the Great with the portrait. Uh, the London monogram is a bonus on the reverse. It's uh, a great coin with a good provenance. It once was part of the stack collection, which was a good collection of Anglo-Saxon coins sold back in 1999 and it's a, a very nice piece. Uh, the next coin I'm going to move on to after that is the Edward I Groat. Now that's a very significant coin because that was the very first four pence coin. Uh, we had only silver pennies up until that time and then Edward I reforms the coinage in 1279 and he introduces the four pence groat coin, which is uh, the largest silver coin at that time in the medieval world. Uh, very endearing portrait of uh, Edward looking out at you from the coin. Uh, minted in London, of course. Um, it's issued for a number of years. Um, there were a number of different die types and varieties, um, but it was not a success overall at the time. They didn't issue any in the reign of Edward II, and they moved on to Edward III uh, before he issued groats again. And then, of course, it was a much more staple coinage and went on from there from the time Edward III onwards as a successful medieval coin. But the Edward I ones were always highly coveted. Uh, they were very popular to mount and wear as badges or brooches. The coin we have in the Smith collection um, is um, a superb example. Never been mounted or worn or gilt or anything like that. It's um, a very well preserved piece and uh, could well be one of the best that could possibly be purchased by a collector. So that's a very interesting piece. It's in at $15,000. So we're moving on to the Tudor period uh, when we get to the Renaissance style portraits and we find Henry the Seventh uh, issuing a silver test doom, which was the largest silver coin of that period of time, the first shilling of the UK uh, as a coin, uh, 12 pence face value with a very lifelike portrait of Henry the Seventh facing to the right. The Smith collection contains an example of the earliest issue of this coinage. Uh, which just has Henricus as the king's name, no numerals after his name as such. So it's from the earliest uh, period of this coinage, uh, which was issued around 1505, uh, and it's in a $25,000 estimate. It's one of the most uh, desirable pieces uh, of that period of time because it is the largest silver coin portrait. Uh, it has a good provenance going back through various auctions. In fact, it was on the front cover of Spink Auction Number no. 1 when they first started auctions in 1978. That time it sold for £8,500, hammer. Um, but it's in the auction here, say, $25,000 estimation in New York in 2020. Um, a very desirable piece. And the other Tudor monarch who also has a very desirable coin in this auction is the Henry VIII uh, Silver Test Dune, a companion shilling coin. Uh, 12 pence face value. Uh, it's got the typical, just how you'd imagine to see Henry VIII uh, facing up out the coin at you in the typical Holbein style. In fact, uh, uh, Holbein had painted his lifelike portrait of Henry by that point in time when he was issuing these coins around 1546, 1547. So no doubt the coin engraver may well have looked at the portrait by Holbein to actually get his inspiration for the uh, engraving of the coin portrait. Um, it's a wonderful piece, um, very good condition because these coins are normally in terrible condition but this one's um, a superlative, uh, very nice uh, piece that you would not normally see. Uh, you've got lovely 
the picture of the king looking out at you, you've got every word very clear, very well centered, very well struck. These coins usually are very weak, they're normally debased. Uh, this coin is probably one, one of the earlier ones issued as it seems to be in good silver. It also has the king's numerals as V111, uh, whereas the later ones just have the figure eight. So this is a very good example at $15,000. Moving on chronologically from there, the next coin we're looking on to is the uh, a more unusual one in the Smith collection. It's actually an Irish coin. Um, it's only diversion away from the British into another series was the Irish uh, Mary Tudor shilling. Uh, because basically the Irish coin is uh, a larger coin portrait in silver than the English coin. The English coin, the largest portrait is a groat, a fourpence, whereas the Irish had a shilling at 12 pence face value, slightly larger. Lovely portrait of young Mary, as a, well, a very young looking queen, probably a very flattering portrait of her looking to the left. Got the Irish uh, harp crowned on the reverse, uh, and it's actually dated as well on the reverse, 1553 in Roman numerals. That's in the uh, auction at $7,500 estimation of the Smith collection. And it's also got a very good provenance. It was once part of the Arnold Madison collection, which was sold in 1984, and uh, the Dangar collection, sold at Glendinning in 1953. So a provenance going back uh, quite some time there, over 65 years. Um, then we're moving on to a more unusual coin again in the Smith collection because it isn't the largest portrait of James I. Um, the James I coin is actually a sixpence. Now why, you ask me, um, well, the reason is because uh, Mr Smith enjoyed some rarities sometimes and uh, basically um, an opportunity came along to buy a heavy flam PA4 coin of the sixpence, which is extremely rare. Uh, the shilling is normally the largest portrait because, of course, he only liked portraits of head and shoulders. He didn't want to buy a crown or a half crown when the king appears distant on horseback. So, basically, um, an opportunity came on with uh, all four PA4 heavy flan sixpences were available as part of the Shuttlewood collection. And, uh, of course, Mr Smith went for the best one available. Um, and it is, as far as we know, the finest example of the uh, heavy flan sixpence of uh, James I. And that's dated 1623. Of the four examples known, uh, one's dated 1622, it's in poor condition, and the other three are all 1623. So this is the best one of the 1623s and the best one of any of the heavy flan sixpences. Moving on to the next uh, one we're going to highlight here in the Smith collection, we've got the wonderful um, Brio, uh, who was the engraver of uh, Brio, um, designed Charles I crown, the Charles I pattern crown by Nicolas Brio, who was the French engraver working at the Mint at the time. Wonderful artistic rendering of the king facing to the left and draped uh, head and shoulders portrait on the obverse. This piece is crown sized, although it doesn't weigh the same as a crown. It's a bit light for a crown. It actually weighs somewhere halfway between a half crown and a crown, but it is crown sized in diameter. Um, perhaps a, pr a proposal, presentation piece, pattern anyway, for uh, designs for a crown. Uh, we've got the obverse with the head and shoulders portrait, as I say, of the king facing to the left. Lovely detail on there, some very fine small detail on his armour and drapery. The uh, reverse shows the typical horseback uh, portrait, the mounted horseman of the king and his armour facing, to, uh, riding to the left on horseback, uh, with a rocky ground beneath, um, which is more like you see on the what was adopted as the crown. It's thought that um, these were struck when Brio was about to do his first milled coinage in 1631. So 1631, maybe 1632 period, this proposal coin was uh, produced. Um, it has an amazing provenance. It goes right back through ownership to uh, 1830. Um, it's been in very famous collections such as Cuff and Wigan, Halliburton Young, Egmont Bieber, Murdoch, Wakeley, Cumberland Clark, Lingford, Thorpe, uh, Anne Brooker and Lord, Lord Smith of Marlow. So various uh, famous owners over the many years it has been uh, in existence and uh, well looked after. Um, this coin, this pattern piece, very unusual, is in at fifteen thousand um, dollars. I'm not aware of more than maybe four pieces uh, of these patterns or proposals by Brio. So it's a very, very unusual opportunity to buy a coin like this. Next coin we're moving on to is the Charles II uh, half crown, uh, hammered half crown. Uh, Mr. Smith decided he would not go for a milled crown, the Charles II, which would be larger. He preferred the hammered coinage, so he said he'd buy the largest portrait in the hammered. And it just so happened that along came at the time he was buying, some 20 years ago. Um, in fact, it was 2001. He actually uh, had the opportunity to buy the front cover coin from the Manville catalogue uh, that was offered at Spink. And this was the uh, Charles II third issue 
hammered half crown where he's got a crown bust facing to the left by Thomas Simon uh, and the reverse with the shield but it's ever so well centered ever so well struck obviously a lot of care and preparation went into striking this coin it wasn't um, just haphazardly minted like most of the third issue pieces were so it's probably quite an early strike from that issue I imagine um, and it's uh, very well presented and it has a good provenance apart from Manville it's also been owned by Hamilton Smith and Thorburn and the Marcus of Aylesbury as coins so it's got a great provenance it's in the auction at $10,000 estimate moving on from there we're looking at the uh, William III proof crown uh, dated 1696 with the third bust of William III uh, this piece is um, a very rare proof um, I mean not a proof as in the modern sense with modern coins from the mint you see now with mirror like surfaces it's just had a lot more care and attention and preparation taken the flan is uh, very even it's an, un it's an oval shape more than a round shape but it's uh, it's been very precisely uh, made and it has got a brilliance to the feels but not like a mirror like brilliance like you see today it's sort of uh, a bit more subtle than that really it's uh, a very unusual piece it has got its own unique elements to the design the shields are slightly different on the reverse to the currency pieces it is the third bust of William III so it's probably a very early striking of the third bust with the drape bust right with the square breastplate uh, the reverse uh, has the shields indented at the top in a different way so they are on the currency the line of Nassau at the, the center of the reverse is also slightly different with the arrangement of the billets in the background to the line on the shield so it is different to currency as well and it is a plain edge um, although if you look around the edge there is some striations where they actually used to straight the edges of these proofs um, but they did proofs for 1695 and 96 96 there is a first bus proof and a third bus this is the third bus one and of course 1696 is the year they did the unique second bus which is in the british museum so it's a very very uh, good year for patterns and proofs at that point in time um, it's a Highly unusual coin. Um, it's going in, I think, at fifteen thousand dollar estimate, and it's part of the Smith collection. I think the last time one is come up for sale in public auction was actually this coin. So they don't come around for sale very often at all. So uh, well worth watching that one. Um, the next coin I'm going to move on to is the uh, Vigo Crown of Queen Anne. Uh, always a very popular coin. Not a rare coin by any means, but it's um, a superb example in the Smith collection. It's uh, one of the finer ones you're going to actually see. Um, it's um, struck very well with um, very good engraving uh, it's got the Vigo under the bust meaning it's been struck from the silver the treasure that was captured from the Spanish at Vigo Bay in October of 1702 on the 23rd of October actually um, basically uh, um, we actually cap we captured all this treasure from the Spanish in the, in the Battle of Vigo Bay um, they basically ended up deserting their ships and their treasure uh, they managed to get spirit away most of the gold by the, by the look of it because not much gold was captured uh, but a great quantity of silver um, came back to the UK and was um, landed at Southampton and then transported with much pomp and ceremony to London uh, where uh, Isaac Newton then basically as master of the mint at that time Sir Isaac Newton the scientist he uh, oversaw the actual transportation of it through London to the mint and uh, a great big coinage was made from the silver especially with the crowns half crowns shillings and sixpences shillings are uh, minted in 1702 but the rest of the coins are all minted dated 1703 and the crown was the largest silver portrait again which, which forms part of the smith collection um, this one uh, when mr smith bought it was thought to be the finest known um, there have been a couple other just as fine that have come about but this one's in at twenty thousand dollar estimation um, and all these coins in the auction are raw by the way they're not actually in slabs uh, they haven't been graded by the grading services. Um, they are actually as, as they were when uh, they were collected by Mr Smith. It's part of the Neil Smith collection. Uh, and then we're going to move on to the next coin. The next coin we're moving on to is the George II proof crown of 1732 with a nice young head portrait, uh, roses and plumes reverse. Uh, this is always a very popular proof coin. It's the... Uh, there are only two proof crowns in the reign of George II, uh, 1732 and 1746. One's young head, one's old head. This is the young head one. This is what uh, came around. This is the one that Mr Smith preferred, preferred to buy for the collection. Um, it's actually once part of the Feddy Van Rokel collection, which was sold in 2001. And it's a very nice example indeed. It's uh, got lovely definition in the hair, a great portrait of the king looking boldly to the left. Uh, draped bust with a lion's face on his shoulder in his armour there and uh, 
reverse has roses and plumes in the angles which um, indicates that the metal was sourced from a mixture of Welsh and English mined silver um, and, ag and again it has uh, a plain edge uh, and it's a very nice example indeed at $15,000 estimation. The next coin we're going to move on to is the Georgia Fourth Proof Crown. Now most people when they think of the Georgia Fourth Proof Crowns they probably think of the 1826 one from the proof sets. Well this is the year before, this is 1825, the much rarer proof crown. With a lovely bare head portrait of William, by William Wine of the King uh, facing to the left. The date was below, very boldly there, 1825. Um, again, it's a plain edge piece. The reverse has a lovely crown shield of arms. And this is sort of the first major work by William Wine uh, since uh, taking over from Pastrucci as the chief engraver. Um, and it's always a very popular design, a very popular coin. And being the 1825 issue is much, much rarer uh, than the 1826, which were issued in their hundreds for the sets. Uh, so the 1825 is more exclusive, and this one's in the sale at $20,000 estimate. The next superb looking coin is the Victorian uh, Proof Crown of 1839. This is one that many people are familiar with as being part of the famous set of coins, the Proof set of coins issued uh, dated 1839 with the gold unit and the line going right down to the copper farthing. And this is the largest silver portrait again uh, as part of the Neil Smith collection. It's the uh, by William Wyan again. It's the young head portrait of Queen Victoria facing to the left. And Wine was actually allowed to sign this one on the truncation of the neck. He's got W Wine R A on the neck. They're very boldly in raised letters, which uh, stands for William Wine, who was a fellow of the Royal Academy. The R A is for Royal Academy, of course. The date is below 1839. The reverse has the crown shield of arms, um, much like uh, the same as the uh, as on the gold sovereigns. Um, of course, this is a larger version of it in silver, and uh, always a very popular piece. The silver proof crown has a lovely toning, lovely uh, iridescent rainbow colours. Um, it was bought from a Sotheby's sale in the year 2000. It's going in the Smith collection at uh, $15,000 in January. And then we move on to the piece de la resistance, the, uh, the main coin in the whole sale. Uh, the front cover coin of this uh, off print of the collection, of the Neil Smith collection. It's the uh, Edward VIII um, pattern crown of dated 1937. It's uh, a very special coin. It's um, one. Well, it's the only opportunity a collector will have to possibly bid on and possibly own um, a single example of the Edward VIII uh, crown because all the other ones are in proof sets. Basically, um, you you cannot buy one of these coins singly anywhere else. Uh, there are there is actually only other one other in private hands as part of the proof set, uh, which is in the Tyrant collection, and that's a complete set. So that's not likely to be broken up. Um, and there are four other proof sets, all in institutions. I think uh, two of the Royal Mint, one's in the British Museum, and the other one's with the Royal Family. So uh, it's a very royal coin to own, it seems, because uh, Edward VIII, in fact, uh, when he later became the Duke of Windsor after abdication, wanted to get hold of one of his uh, sets of coins, or at least a coin, and he uh, asked his uh, brother, the King, George VI, whether he could be allowed to own a proof set. Uh, once he heard they'd been discovered, uh, and uh, they, the king had actually had to refuse. He said no. Um, so Edward VIII wasn't even allowed to actually own one of these own coins. So it's a very special coin. Um, it's It's been on the market a few times over the last sort of 40 or 50 years. So the first time it appeared for sale in public auction was in 1978 in an American auction. Um, it was in another American auction in 1998, I believe, and then this is the third time it's been in an American auction. So it's going to be offered on the night of Wednesday the 15th of January at 7pm, well, after 7pm, uh, where it'll be part of the Neil Smith collection. It's going to go in for what sounds a very reasonable $150,000 estimation. Um, I mean, there was a never the eighth penny not sold so long ago, just a couple of months ago, for a um, equivalent of that in dollars so uh, the crown being the largest silver portrait and the largest you know, largest coin you can possibly get really uh, as the five pound piece is um, a little bit smaller in diameter I think is um, it's a very unique opportunity perhaps to uh, buy such a rarity um, lovely depiction of the king facing to the left uh, by uh, Humphrey Paget and the reverse is by Kruger Grey with the uh, crown supporters and arms just like on the George VI crowns uh, but it's his Edward VIII, of course, so an unrivaled opportunity, I think, and uh, it'll be very exciting to see what happens on the night. So thank you for listening, and uh, very good.